Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 33rd meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I remind everyone, please, to make sure their mobile phones are on silent? There has been one apology given, and that is from Jamie Green, who is unable to t attend today. The first item on the agenda is a transport update. And before I go th and introduce uh, the the uh, people giving evidence, I'd like to ask members if there is anyone who'd like to declare an interest. Um, and I know Stuart would like to start off on that. Um, I just remind members I'm the Honorary President of the Scottish Association for Public Transport and the Honorary Vice President of Rail Future UK. Okay, Rhoda. Um, just, um, it's in the, my register of interest that I'm Honorary Vice President of Friends of the Far North Line. Okay, Gail. I am also Honorary Vice President of Friends of the Far North Line. Is there anyone else who'd like to declare an interest? No. Okay, so this evidence session is a regular update to the committee from the Scottish Government, and it enables the committee to monitor the transport policy and project developments. I therefore like to welcome Hamza Youssef, the Minister for Transport in the Islands, John Nichols, the Director, Aviation, Maritime Freight and Canals, Bill Reeve, the Director of Rail, Heather Cowan, the Head of Transport Strategy and European Funding. Uh, Minister, would you like to make a brief opening statement? Uh, that emphasis, uh, so subtle, Mr. Convener, that I will take uh, the, the hint, uh, certainly. So what I'll do, uh, Convener, is just give a broad overview, and of course there'll be many issues that we'll delve into uh, the time of discussion, uh, undoubtedly. In terms of um, ferries, I thought it would be worth mentioning that since I last appeared in front of the committee uh, on transport in general in March, uh, I announced that a scheme, uh, I, have, I have announced recently a scheme to significantly reduce fares in the Northern Isles ferry service that will be rolled out in the first half of 2018. Now, a road equivalent tariff will be introduced in the Pentland Firth routes, uh, Pentland Firth routes, uh, my apologies, whilst a variant of the RAT scheme uh, will be brought in on the routes from Aberdeen to Kirkwall and Lerwick. That will see passenger fares cut uh, by an average of more than 40%, while car uh, fares will be reduced by an average of more than uh, 30%. My, my overriding priority, obviously, is to provide the best ferry services possible. On the 2nd of February uh, 2017, I made a statement to Parliament announcing that a policy review would be undertaken into the future of procurement of light line ferry services. On the 20th of July, I further informed the Scottish Parliament that the policy review would be extended beyond its autumn timeline to ensure full compliance with TECO and to allow more detailed consideration of the complex state aid uh, rules. Uh, particularly the fourth Altmark criteria. I also committed to publishing an interim report setting out emerging findings from the review, including the implications of our three uh, lifeline ferry contracts, uh, namely Clyde and Hebrides, Northern Isles uh, and Gurik Danoon. Um, I will be doing that in the next few weeks. In terms of, of, of roads, we publish our future intelligent transport strategy, uh, published in, in November. Uh, this has been developed in context of increasing car, uh, in-car in technology, developing and data management. Uh, we're firmly committed, of course, to continually improving and using technology to improve the experience for the road user. Uh, we have also, of course, uh, since my last appearance at the committee in terms of uh, transport in March, um, we have, uh, of course, completed a number of, of major infrastructure projects, which, again, uh, undoubtedly we can delve into, whether that's uh, the Queensferry Crossing, um, uh, of course, uh, the improvement works on the M8, M73, uh, M74, uh, as well, uh, but uh, above and beyond that, uh, we're also, of course, uh, taking forward uh, projects that we've committed to in the long term. For example, uh, the new 7.5 kilometre section of dual carriageway between Kincraig and Dalradi uh, opened uh, late August, significant milestone in achieving the Scottish Government's ambitions to introduce more than 80 miles of new dual carriageway uh, on the A9. Uh, we're also, of course, pushing ahead with our safety measures on our roads uh, as well. Uh, members will be aware uh, of uh, uh, average speed cameras recently going live on on the A19, that 51.5-mile uh, stretch between uh, Dundee and Stonehaven. Now, we're very confident that that will have uh, the same uh, safety reduction uh, benefits that we've seen on the A9 and, indeed, on the A77 uh, as well. Uh, on uh, our railways, 
Uh, I know, uh, again, that you had uh, an update a few weeks ago from Alex Hines in terms of uh, major uh, projects. And again, I'm more than happy because of brevity of the opening statement to go into detail during discussions on, on projects from Egypt uh, right the way through to the other major uh, projects and, and where they, they are at. Um, I thought it might be worthwhile just giving a slight update, a, a brief update in my opening statement uh, on uh, our, our ambition to have a public sector uh, bidder uh, for uh, future uh, Scottish Rail franchises. Uh, we have obviously made the necessary changes uh, to the legislation. We've been holding uh, cross-party meetings, and uh, I'm pleased to say every single political party here has been involved uh, in those discussions, as have, of course, the trade unions uh, and others. Um, we are at the stage where we're now giving consideration to what the appropriate vehicle would be to take forward uh, a future public sector uh, bidder as well. There's also ongoing discussions um, convener with uh, the UK government on railway funding uh, for control period six. Again, maybe something uh, that I can delve into and in, in, into discussion, so I won't go into it in my opening statement, other than to say there's a significant shortfall between uh, the industry's aspirations in Scotland and what's currently on offer, but those negotiations are live. Uh, worth touching on uh, the fact that, of course, since uh, my appearance in March on, on, on transport, uh, there has been uh, of course, a programme for government and a number of the commitments made in the programme for government were about decarbonising transport, really at the, the, the heart of the First Minister's programme uh, for government. So we're progressing, uh, of course, with that ambition to reduce or to phase out, I should say, the need for diesel and petrol cars by 2032. That's eight years ahead of the UK uh, target. Significant work being done internally to see how we reached uh, that target, which will need, uh, of course, an increase in uh, infrastructure as well as behavioural change and so on and so forth. And again, happy to, to, to elaborate during our discussions. Uh, low emission zones will be part of the decarbonising transport too. Delighted to have Glasgow announced as the first uh, with uh, four, uh, Scotland's four biggest cities by 2020 and then other uh, air management quality uh, zones uh, thereafter as well. Also continuing to support uh, active travel, the doubling of the active travel budget, something I'm particularly proud of. Uh, how we spend that so that we get the, uh, the, the most bang for our buck will be incredibly important. Uh, on the back of also a uh, very important Liberal Democrat uh, amendment during a recent active travel debate, uh, clearly we'll be looking at how we target uh, those in the early years uh, as well for cycle uh, training. And then, of course, there is the issue around buses, which, again, I will elaborate in more detail if the committee wish to, to talk over. But uh, as I've said many times before, convener, I'm not uh, content to preside over or manage decline. So, therefore, we have a number of consultations that are ongoing from concessionary travel, which has just closed, uh, right the way through to the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the measures we wish to take in the transport bill around buses, which include, uh, but are not exclusive to, uh, local franchising, municipally owned bus companies, uh, open, open data uh, and, par and enhanced partnerships uh, and smart ticketing as well. So um, with all of that, uh, I've tried to be as brief as I can in uh, my opening statement, a very broad overview. And as I say, I uh, can be really happy to take questions on these issues uh, or, of course, uh, any other issues in the transport portfolio. Thank you, Minister. Before we uh, go into a series of questions, there is one incident that has arisen as a result of something that happened last night. And the Deputy Convener would like to ask you a particular question on that. Sorry. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Minister, can you update people in the North Highlands as to what the current situation is with the landslide on the line between Inverness and Bewley, please? Uh, yes, uh, I can. Obviously, an unfortunate uh, incident uh, that has taken place uh, because of the uh, recent weather. There's been a landslip uh, which has seen 30 to 40 tonnes of material from the embankment fall onto a line, uh, as you say, uh, just uh, at Dingwall now. Uh, as of last night, uh, straight away, of course, engineers were on site. You may well have seen uh, some of the pictures on, on Network Rail and Scott Rail's uh, social media accounts. Uh, the, it shows the extent of the damage done. I should say that material actually did uh, interact with, uh, with some rolling stock. Uh, on the line at the time. Thankfully, nobody uh, injured as a result, but clearly damage done to the infrastructure and indeed that piece of rolling stock. Um, there has also, as of uh, 8.02 this morning, been a further uh, landslip in the vicinity as well. Uh, in order to safely work on the line, as members would understand, it's important that that line is closed today. Well, clearly, when it is safe to open it as soon as possible, uh, the Network Rail and Scott Rail uh, will, will make that decision to do so uh, at the moment they need to ensure that the line is safe to work on um, and I can provide the member and ensure that the member gets and any other member that has an interest in this gets an update uh, where appropriate but it is absolutely likely well the line is closed today uh, whether it will be open uh, today remains doubtful 
uh, whether, whether, it'll, whether it will open today remains doubtful. Uh, but uh, clearly, the member will understand with that much material, uh, that much, uh, you know, that uh, 30 to 40 tonnes of material onto the onto the railway line, uh, clearly safety is, is paramount. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, I want to uh, ask uh, some questions on Egypt, and then I'll uh, continue. Uh, to uh, explore what's happening on the 385 uh, rolling stock. Uh, so, firstly, on, on Egypt, there have been a number of delays, and I just uh, wonder if the Minister could update us on uh, what's being done to minimise the effect of any further delays and respond to the delays that there have been. I, mean, I share every single member around this table's frustration uh, at the delays on, on, on Egypt and what I did when these delays uh, first came to my attention as Transport Minister was look at the governance of our major projects. Uh, clearly to me the governance and the way major projects have been funded and therefore delivered uh, has not been as efficient as, ob as obviously it should be. So uh, one was to create this portfolio board uh, which is chaired by the, the Head of Transport Scotland um, to, to have a closer integration alignment between all the stakeholders involved so the fund of the client, and indeed uh, Network Rail is, 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 is a contractor who's um, delivering uh, these, uh, these projects. What we've seen is that that flushes out some of the problems earlier. Now, that, the, the, that's a plus, but the negative is, of course, you've still got to deal with the issues that are flushed out. Um, so, you know, th there's some positives around that. There's also been some political action, and when it comes to Egypt in particular, uh, when it comes to 385s, uh, you know, there's regular dialogue between myself, Mark Carn, and, and Alex Hines. Um, there's also been intervention from the First Minister, uh, as the member will be aware, when it comes to meeting with uh, uh, ScotRail Alliance, but also with uh, Hitachi when it comes to 385s. Uh, but also, uh, I have looked at the next control period because it's, you know, we clearly want to learn lessons for future infrastructure projects. So for the next control period, I've suggested that we move to a more flexible pipeline approach, uh, which, will have, which will demonstrate better cost estimates for projects at a more developed stage uh, as opposed to very early cost estimates where we just have to you know, uh, make up the, the, the funding uh, shortfall as we go along uh, or the cost increases as we go along, which for me is just not a good place for the government to be, but clearly uh, not a good place for the, uh, the Scottish taxpayer to be either. Uh, Thank you for that. Clearly, uh, Network Rail have some successes, the, re -re the opening of the new forest station and other upgrades on uh, Inverness, Aberdeen are to be welcome. But, but right across the GB network, we've seen um, Network Rail having difficulties, although we're seeing some improvements. Are you satisfied that Mr Khan uh, has got a grip on what's going on at Network Rail so that... Uh, will not see a repetition of the, the kind of uh, uh, delays and, uh, and changes that have had to be made uh, as a result of uh, their projects? You know, I have fairly regular dialogue now mm -hmm. with Mark Carn, and that certainly uh, helped. And uh, what I would say is that Mark has promised me his personal intervention and personal attention when it comes to Egypt in particular, but also some of the other projects that we have uh, which we may discuss uh, also. So I've been pleased, I have to say, and reassured by his personal intervention in that it certainly has seemed to make some difference. Now, my argument to, to Mark Khan and others has been, well, if you knew that bringing staff up, for example, from, from other projects, or, or if you knew that there was a problem with staff turnover on Egypt, that should have been dealt with many, many months ago. We might not have been in this position, but look, we are where we are. Uh, and his personal attention, I believe, uh, is now helping to, 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 to rectify the situation, so certainly um, stop any, any further uh, slippage, but uh, that doesn't mean that there won't be. Uh, we'll continue to flush out where we think there's some issues. Um, but having the partners, you know, Network Rail, um, of course the, the, the ORR as the regulator, uh, Abellio, um, <coughs> you know, aligned and integrated along with the train manufacturer where that's appropriate, having them integrated on regular conversations and regular calls, which may well just seem like absolute common sense to you and I, but the fact that it wasn't happening to a level it should have, the fact that it's now happening, we're seeing results uh, of that. And, and, and we're seeing that there's now, you know, in, in other major road projects, I know you're talking about Egypt, but in other projects, for example, like the Highland Main Line, we've seen that uh, we've managed to reduce costs while still preserving the same outcomes. So, you know, we're seeing some successes in other projects 
Um, now we just want to ensure that uh, we can get the right result for the passengers travelling between Edinburgh and Glasgow and, and the intermediate stations. Um, well, they will be travelling at some point on 385s. Alec Hines indicated uh, that he, when he appeared before us, that he couldn't uh, commit to a particular date that was happening, although uh, he was suggesting early next year. Now, my personal sources suggest that Hitachi are having uh, some difficulties with productivity at their Ailes plant where the 385s are uh, being built. Uh, are you aware of that? Are my sources wrong on that matter? Um, and fundamentally, uh, given that it appears that Hitachi is the source of the delays, uh, will costs related to that bear upon Hitachi? Oh. It's a good set of questions. I, I was in Newton Cliff visiting Hitachi on Monday. So I went down to see for myself, because uh, as a former transport minister, you, the member knows only too well that you'll hear various versions from different sources and, and, and different stakeholders. So I decided to take a look for myself at the 385s and um, speak with the uh, senior team at Hitachi and Newton Aycliffe. So I did so on, on Monday. In fairness to Hitachi, what I would say is they're up front that there have been some issues around the scheduling of their, their programmes. Uh, they're working on a number of projects, as, as again the member will be aware of, intercity trains and so on and so forth. Um, it's a new plant. Uh, again, the members will be of that only a few yeah. years old. Uh, it is a very impressive plant in terms of the size, in terms of the scale of the workforce. Um, they are saying that because of that and because of the, the training that's needed and the vast, vast majority of their staff or workforce coming from a 50 kilometre radius of, of Newton Aycliffe, um, they've had issues around uh, uh, programme uh, scheduling and therefore delivery. So it's fair to say, as the member suggests, some of the problems and issues have come on the manufacturing side, but it's also very fair to say that clearly, as it's well documented, there's been delays with the electrification process. Um, so it would be unfair, and I think it's probably unhelpful, that there's finger pointing between Network Rail and, and Hitachi, whereas what I've said to all the partners is, frankly speaking, uh, we'll deal with whose fault it is when the time comes. Let's get these trains, the 385s that people expect, let's get them built, of course, first and foremost. Let's get them tested. Let's get the approvals and the type approvals. Let's get them on into service and running uh, here in Scotland and get passengers uh, on them. Uh, in terms of his, his final part of his questions about penalties uh, being, uh, yes, there is a mechanism for uh, penalties uh, available uh, to, to, to Abellio Scott Rail. Uh, and I, as I say, those discussions uh, in terms of, uh, within the terms of the contract and the franchise agreement will take place. I've got no doubt uh, about that. But my overriding priority, of course, is to ensure there's no additional cost to the taxpayer, as the member alludes to. But uh, really is to get these 385s here so that passengers can enjoy the experience. I think this needs a brief answer, if I may. Um, is it fair to say that the th delivery of the 385s is now the key point on the critical path to getting Egypt to where we want it to be? Uh, yes, it's clearly one of the, the primary factors and vital components of that. But the member is, is undoubtedly aware that there's, there's, that there's more to be done than just getting the 385s in the line. And also, I would say, when it comes to that, wider ambition of uh, short and journey times for December 2018. There's other factors like SDA yeah. and, and, and so on and so forth, again, which the member is aware of. So yes, it's fair to say that the delivery of the 385s is a critical part of the Egypt project. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring Raider in. Could I just say that all, all answers uh, what were required to be answered fully, but briefly is, is really good, Minister, without, without being rude to you. Uh, yeah. Raider, could I... <laughs> Could I bring you in, and then John? I, I noticed we've got through questions, two questions of rather a long, lengthy uh, session, and we're, and we're 20 minutes in already. So, Rader, if I could bring you in, and then just, John. Just very briefly, have any of the trains had to be returned to the manufacturer? Sorry, uh, how have many it, of which trains? The 385s. Um, so I'm not following. How many of them have to be returned? No, have any of them had to? Oh. Be? Uh, not that I'm aware of, I and mean, we've received delivery of uh, 385s uh, most recently, but I'll look toward my director of rail. But I don't uh, think I'm not, not, not aware of any being no. returned. Um, uh, there are issues arising on testing, that's what you do mm. testing for, which will require some work to address some of the issues that have been found on testing. Some of that work will take place in Newton Aycliffe, some of that work will take place in Scotland, but I'm not aware of any trains having, uh, having been returned. Okay. Thank you. Uh, John. 
Thank you. Um, so following on from uh, Stuart Stevenson's line of questioning, could you just talk us through where we're going now with the Glasgow-Edinburgh line? Um, I think, am I right in saying we'll see some electric trains from early December, and then will it be a mixture of electric and <coughs> diesel kind of as we go through the year? Will that kind of gradually change? And are we confident then that when we get to December 18, it'll be eight car trains, 42 minutes? Uh, yes, again, uh, can, in the interest of brevity, I honestly wasn't filibustering uh, at all, but in the interest of brevity, um, you know, we can lay out the Egypt milestones if you push in writing, but yes, he's absolutely right in what he says. There'll be his 380s, a couple of 380s that will run so passengers by the December timetable uh, of this year will be able to experience electric uh, trains, electric service. They'll run in two separate diagrams. Um, thereafter, of course, we are at the moment testing uh, 385s and they'll be introduced when it's safe to do so. If the testing comes back clear, if the ORR approvals, the type testing, uh, they'll slowly start to be phased. And I think Alex Hines in his uh, last um, appearance at the committee gave an idea of how many uh, 385s roughly there would be by February. And then, of course, then there's the, 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 the May timetable change uh, and there's a phased approach exactly as the member suggests. And, and yes, uh, to answer his question again in the interest of brevity, uh, we're still aiming towards that December 18 for the 42-minute journey time. Thank you. Yes, I think when we get to railways, we could all talk a bit longer than we probably are allowed to. Um, my other point, though, was on uh, Glasgow Airport, um, also obviously rail-related. Uh, can you give us any update? Because I think we've been hearing slightly confusing signals, uh, some people saying that uh, we're going ahead with the, the plant of a, a tram train, and then there's apparently been a Jacobs report suggesting that uh, there's problems with that. So can you mm. give us the <coughs> government's view on that at the moment. Hmm. I, I, hope, I hope there's not been too much confusion in the sense that myself and, and in Glasgow City Council, uh, the comments that I've seen have been fairly aligned actually. Um, what I would say is that, um, of course, uh, the Scottish Government, the UK Government are putting money towards the City Deal. It's for the City Deal partners to come forward with the projects that they wish to see funded. In terms of the, the rail link and the airport access project, as it's known, um, what the Scottish sure. Government has said is that on the receipt of the outline business case, which we received, we would commission an independent report, which was done by Jacobs. That independent report, which again, I must stress, an independent report has asked questions of the airport access project in and around the costs and in and around the impact it would have on other services, namely, if I remember correctly, the Ayrshire and Inverclyde services. Uh, that report has then gone back, of course, to the councils involved, and it's for the councils to come back to give us answers and reassurances around that. Now, what the council have said from the comments that I've seen, which I think is eminently sensible, is as well as looking to address the questions that the independent report has thrown up, let's not be close-minded to other options that can, that we, where we can use that 144 million that's earmarked for, for the rail link, where we can use that money in perhaps a more cost-effective, efficient way while still solving uh, the problem of the airport access, uh, uh, Glasgow airport access. So I'm very open to that approach. I'll continue with the high-level meeting. Uh, the member will remember before the local elections, I, I called the, the, the main partners on the table, uh, and I'll continue with that approach. But I think the... The, the comments from the councils involved have been eminently sensible. Uh, they have my support uh, in that. So we want to find collectively a solution to airport access uh, and we'll work with uh, City Deal partners to, 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 to move that along. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, the next question, Mike Rumbles. <coughs> Minister, we found out just today that Scott Rail's punctuality, excuse me, <coughs> was down for a third month in a row. The latest figures as of the 11th of November show that only 83% of trains arrive within five minutes compared to 86% in the same period last year. Even the annual moving average has fallen over the last three periods and is now standing at 90.8%, only 0.1% 0 .1 above the level required as acceptable. Punctuality is obviously heading in the wrong direction at the moment. So my question is really, what is being done to ensure performance improves? I concur with the members' <coughs> disappointment and frustration whenever there's a dip in performance. Um, what I would say, and I think Alex Hines again made this point at his last appearance in committee, that there is always a seasonal effect on the railways, regardless of whether that railway is in Scotland or the rest of the United Kingdom. There's always autumnal effects. I know some members that are in this committee had a, had, a, had a shot, as it was, in the simulator that showed the effects on leaf 
uh, fall and adhesion uh, on, on the railways, which is a serious point. And so we expect that when it comes to autumn time, there generally is, is a dip in performance. Uh, that's not to excuse a dip in performance. Uh, you know, we continue to monitor that, and the PIP, the Performance Improvement Plan, uh, is a live, evolving document. So that continues to be there. Um, what I would say is that uh, from figures provided by ScotRail, uh, autumn effectively, their uh, consideration came earlier uh, than it usually does. And therefore, they've now seen, I think, 80 to 90% of leaf fall, and, and they're expecting to exit autumn. That means that I would be looking very closely over the next period and the periods to come to ensure that performance reflects that. Now, if performance doesn't reflect that, it continues to go in the trajectory that Mr Rumbles uh, rightly points out, then that would give me huge cause for concern and therefore we'd have to look at what further actions we need to take as part of the performance improvement plan. The reason I'm not pressing the panic button is because since the performance improvement plan uh, was put forward, uh, we have seen a marked improvement. Even our harshest critics would have to admit that there's been a marked improvement uh, in the performance since the performance uh, improvement plan to the extent where uh, ScotRail became the best performing large operator in the UK, where they received record uh, best satisfaction rating at 90%. And although the moving annual average, as the member rightly says, is uh, dips likely, we're still in around the region of 27 to 3% ahead of the UK average. Now, if that continues to decline, <coughs> then I'll simply, uh, clearly that will not be uh, acceptable and we'll have to look at uh, measures that we take. But the reason why I'm not pressing the panic button is because we expected after the summer months where there's, a, there's an upturn, as the member would imagine, that when you get into autumn, tail end of September, October, November, as we are now, then you would expect to see some dips in performance. Mm -hmm. But we'll be keeping a close eye on it. And of course, if members wish more detail on performance in the next few periods, then of course we'll, we'll look to make sure that the, the committee is provided with that. Can um, Mike, I'm going to let you come back to get a, br a brief answer from yeah, the I, Minister. I understand, but we're all comparing the same period in the year the same period last year, so I understand what's saying, but it, it does seem strange. And you mentioned that <clears throat> we we're slightly ahead of the rest of the UK, but of course we're being told that ScotRail's right time, arriving on time, is 52%. It's 7.5% below the G, uh, British average. Um, so I, my, my same question is what's, what's being done to increase right time arrivals? Again, to try to answer uh, briefly, if I can, uh, why it's different this period compared to last period is because of what Alex Hines and Scott Rail have said already, that autumn has come earlier this year, so that is why perhaps you're seeing that. Uh, in terms of uh, the second part of his question on right time, the reason why there's the industry standard measure is PPM, which is four minutes and 59, as opposed to right time, which is two in a minute, uh, is because there are some passengers, understandably, that need longer when it comes to getting on and off trains. Those with mobility issues, which I know the member has a great interest in, uh, you know, mothers and fathers with prams uh, and others. So they can, uh, and also sometimes that time is needed uh, in, in relation to onward connection. So that is why the standard industry measure is PPM. Also, um, the reason why we focus on PPM and, and not so much on right-time arrival, though I appreciate that's also important to people, the reason is you know, we have a focus on journey times and improving journey times. Now, if we didn't have that focus one, and, 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 and the focus was on right time, there would be a temptation to, to increase journey times. I think that is not a place that I want to go. So the standard industry measures PPM. Uh, we'll continue to, to use um, PPM, and that is the standard industry measure across the United Kingdom. Rider. Can I just ask how many months in the length of the contract have a Abellia Scott Rail met the contractual obligations? Uh, I don't have the number on the top of, of, of my head, so I mean, uh, probably better that I write to the member uh, with that uh, detail. Minister, if I could remind you, if you could write to the committee so we Sorry. can then pass it on rather than write to the member directly. Sorry, just to... John. Good morning, uh, good morning, Minister. Uh, morning. Minister, I'm a regular user of ScotRail. I think it's a really good service and, and I, I value the work the staff put in. Of course, any organisation learns from complaints. And uh, I, I, last night I was in touch with Mr Hines about a number of issues, uh, not least uh, the complaint system. And if I just read you a message sent to me by a constituent, online complaint form to complain about online access when travelling on their service. A few weeks later, get an email telling me their online complaint service doesn't work. Now, I get a print of this and it's headed up customers relations query 
and it says in line three, emails to the inbox are not monitored. Please refer to the contact details below. Now, I'm hoping this is a blip, but given that this is an important customer satisfaction, it's an important aspect, would you undertake to take a personal interest in this aspect, please? Uh, of course I will. And the, <clears throat> the, the member will, will know, of course, as Transport Minister, I can't micromanage uh, the business. He's not, expecting me, he's not expecting me to do that, but what he is asking is very, very reasonable that you know, where service falls below the expected... Uh, the expectations, right expectations, I would say, of, of consumer, uh, commuters and passengers, then clearly the complaints procedure, the delay and repay schemes must be able to reflect that to adequately compensate uh, passengers. So uh, if he doesn't mind, then I'll, I'll take the details that uh, he has asked me to look at and investigate. And again, I'll report back to the committee um, um, on that. Thank you. Uh, Richard. Good morning, <coughs> Minister. For my first question, I only need a two-word answer. Um, last week it was made out that uh, Abelio are making people redundant, making people redundant. Uh, uh, so what is it? Enforced redundancy or voluntary severance? Um, it's voluntary. Uh, they're, they're, he'll know that through the franchise agreement there's no compulsory redundancies. My understanding also is that it's not affecting frontline staff, it's clerical management. Uh, and others, but uh, if nobody takes up the voluntary package, then nobody would lose their job. It's, there's no compulsory redundancies. Right, so we've, we've cleared that up, and I've, I've actually put a, 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 um, an amendment, amend, amending motion down in regard to that comment. Um, what discussions has Transport Scotland had with Abellio about the ScotRail voluntary servant scheme, including any assurances that it will not impact on safety or customer service? because the TSSA union has raised concern about the Abellio launching this voluntary service. So what assurances can we give the union and also the travelling public? I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm due with a meeting for the unions uh, in, in the next couple of days or potentially maybe next week. So uh, I'll speak to them, but also hear their concerns. I, I never dismiss the concerns of, of unions, have a very good relationship with whether it's the TSSA or RMT or, or, or ASLEF uh, as well. So I'll listen to, to what they have to say, but what I will do is also in turn reiterate what Scotty have said to me. Obviously, I've spoken to them about um, the voluntary leaver scheme. Uh, they say to me that there has a specific audience, management, admin, clerical staff, and those who work in corporate functions. The scheme is not applicable to frontline staff. Um, they also, of course, confirm their policy, which I reminded them of, which was no compulsory redundancies remain in place for anybody who currently has a job in the business, and if they want to continue to work in the business, they will continue to have uh, a job. Uh, clearly, in any organisation and industry, there's not just modernisations, but efficiencies that are looked to be found, um, and, and, and where people can be retrained, um, and um, uh, they can develop uh, their skills, uh, then, then clearly, uh, if that is done in line with the staff, in line with unions, uh, then that is an agreed process. Um, what I would say is that we have a, you know, this was my predecessor's predecessor, Keith Brown, who absolutely insisted as part of uh, uh, the franchise, no compulsory redundancies should be a key element of that, and it continues to be so. Thank you. Uh, John. Thank you, Kavina. Uh, Minister, you'll know I raised that to First Minister's questions and very clearly said voluntary leaver scheme. Uh, I certainly haven't suggested other than that. And, and you've suggested that these are mainly administrative support functions. So... Do I take from that, if there are issues with cleanliness and non-functioning toilets, again, an issue that I written to uh, Mr Haynes about last night, um, that's uh, unconnected with the reduction in cleaning staff at certain locations, that's not, not related to these schemes, um, so, however people are encouraged to leave, because clearly non-functioning toilets and long-running trains and um, cleanliness, that starts to become a public health issue if it's not properly addressed. Well, I agree with my member entirely <coughs> that uh, you know, we have a very robust uh, process in place. He'll know about the Squire regime, which is the most robust regime uh, on these islands in terms of uh, expectations of uh, train functions and operations, particularly one of the Squire, uh, one of the things that is measured during the Squire regime is cleanliness uh, of toilets. Uh, and he's right to raise that as an issue. And it's actually something, uh, as again, he knows the reason why there's been some financial penalties on ScotRail is because they haven't met uh, the very high thresholds that, we, 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 uh, that, that, that are within the Squire regime. Uh, but let me just reiterate what ScotRail have told us. The specific audience for this voluntary leaver scheme is management, admin 
and clerical staff and all those who work in corp corporate functions, this scheme is not applicable to frontline staff. And I would just uh, reiterate those marks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Minister, as, as you brought that, that uh, square regime up, can I ask you a quest uh, two questions on it? First of all, could you tell me how much is currently sitting in the square fund and what applications you've had from Scott Rail to use that funds during the course of, of the next period, please? Um, I, I noted that the maybe in the convener that asked the exact same question to Alex Hines when, when he arrived. And so uh, if, uh, I don't have that information about the exact number, amount in the Squire Fund because you'll know it continually uh, increases and evolves. Uh, <coughs> except, well, we hope that it decreases because we'd, we'd, we'd want them to meet those Squire requirements. So again, if the convener's okay, I'll make sure he gets a written response fairly quickly. Uh, in terms of uh, any particular um, schemes that uh, uh, Scott Rail have suggested to Transport Scotland, uh, again, I'm not aware at this moment. So, again, if the convener is content, I'll write to him, unless my director of Rail no, wishes to add anything in particular. To uh, no, I, th I think perhaps it's simplest if we give you an update on uh, current schemes underway, and, and, and you'll appreciate the number varies every period uh, according to how the inspections have gone. Uh, but we'll give you a current statement of, uh, of funds in uh, of sums in the fund and current proposals for its use. Okay, so if, if we can leave that, that you'll come back with the amount of money that's in the Square Fund and a list of all suggestions by Scott Rail made in the last, should we say, six months for use of the Square Funds, so that the committee can see whether uh, how that's being used. You're you're happy to do that, Minister? Yes, I I, 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 I am of course happy to do that. I'm not entirely sure whether it's always a, a formal written submission or list of schemes that Scotty will give us or whether it's done through a regular dialogue and conversation, but either way we'll compile a list uh, with the agreement of Scott Rail and provide that to you. Um, yes, it would be very helpful to see exactly what, because they are the, as my understanding is the, the, of the Square Fund usage, it's up to Scott Rail to make suggestions to Transport Scotland how the funds should be used. So I think that I, what I would like to see uh, so the committee can understand it, is how, what applications have been made. Okay. Uh, Minister, the, the next question uh, falls to me as well, which is that media reports indicate that the UK government has proposed a change in the formula used for calculation the proportion of funds allocated to Network Rail Scotland. Uh, can you just tell me uh, when you became aware of that and what impact it could have on rail development in Scotland, please? The question of when I became aware of this actually goes to the very heart of the issue and the heart of the frustration that I feel uh, around this. I mean, I, you know, we received the formal funding offer from the Treasury after close of business the day before I had a statutory obligation to publish the statement of funds available. That was the 13th of October. So the fact that there had been no engagement or discussion around unilaterally the UK government deciding to change the funding formula from the devolved settlement previously agreed to, to one now uh, based around in Barnet. The fact that we received formal uh, that funding offer from the Treasury the night before we're due to publish the statement of funds, again, goes to the heart of my frustration and my annoyance. Uh, again, the, the convener will be aware that um, you know, I find uh, that uh, funding uh, offer to be uh, £600 million short of what the industry tells us they need. Um, I can go into the detail of, 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 of why that uh, funding offer uh, doesn't quite meet the expectations, not just of ourselves, but also uh, of, uh, uh, of the industry itself. But fair to say the fact that we received the formal funding offer the night before the 13th of October, for me, is, is, is the very problem that we face. Okay. Well, I mean, Alex Hines, when he came to the committee, uh, I think it was about two weeks ago, was asked this specific question. And I read, went back and looked at the official report. And I think that the, the question Jamie Green had put to him was, is it your understanding that the proposal, when we were talking about how the funding was split between operations, maintenance and renewal of the network, that there would be enough money required for the maintenance of Scotland's tracks. And the argument is around how much additional money will be given for additional upgrades. Now, Alex Hines answered simply with the word yes. So it appears that this, that this issue of funds is about what extra funds would be required to upgrade the network, not to maintain it. Is that your understanding, or have, have I misunderstood the evidence that Alex Hines has given the committee? Uh, when it comes to railway funding, there is the maintenance operations and renewals part, which is important, of course. That is for the safe 
you know, maintenance of our rail network. And then there is the enhancements part. But enhancements shouldn't be looked at uh, as, as that evidence uh, that you've read out suggests, that it isn't just all around new pieces of infrastructure and, and kit, uh, like the border railway. What it also means, of course, is necessary upgrades in order to meet current growth demands and capacity issues, as well as future demand. For an example of that would be the package of works around the East Coast mainline, which are absolutely necessary. We know the East Coast mainline is bursting to the, to the seams. It needs urgent attention. And as part of that, for example, we'll do, we'll do a, a series of works around the East Coast mainline, which include, for example, the, the construction of East Linton and, and Reston stations. So they're necessary. So when it comes to, to that, there's no, there's, no, there's no difference between the UK government and the Scottish government in respect to you need a budget for maintenance, operations, renewals, plus enhancements. Where the disagreement comes is in some of the figures and the facts that are used. Let me give you some examples, uh, convener, if I can. Um, the UK government is looking at the drawdown of debt for control period five and using a figure of 3.1 billion. Where they have got that figure from, I have no idea. When I spoke to the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, along with Mr Mackay, she also didn't seem to be able to give me an answer of where that 3.1 billion. The figure that we agreed was 3.3 billion. That is also the figure that's been agreed, uh, having confirmed it with Network Rail, that the drawdown in control period five, at the end of control period five, we're working to is 3.3 billion. So already there's a 200 million gap which has come out of nowhere. Add to that the fact that when it comes to looking at refinancing and financing costs, the UK government have, you know, on, on the one hand, uh, used where it suits them uh, a figure of 11.17. And on the other hand, where it suits them, they've used a figure of 9%. There's not consistency in the figure that's being used. And the third point, which is a really easy point to understand, is that the ORR, the original, the, the, the 2005 settlement pre the SNP-led Scottish government, was based on ORR advice that we should be funded 11.17% because that reflects the size and the scale of the Scottish Rail Network. The fact that the DFT have now moved to 10.4%, that's, that's what the funding offer would be in relation to the DFT grant to England and Wales. Unilaterally, without a single, without picking up the phone, without writing me a letter, without the courtesy of even engaging and conversation, to me, uh, shows uh, a lack of respect, first of all. Uh, at very best, it shows we're an afterthought. But it has real consequences here, which has seen us fall £600 million short of what the industry tells us they need. So, uh, you know, after the conversation with the Chief Secretary of Treasury and highlighting these inconsistencies of figures, in fairness to her, she promised to go back to look at those inconsistencies and come back to us. Now, I'm hoping they do that, uh, and the revised offer certainly gets us closer to, if not to that £4.2 billion figure. Okay, so, Minister, I'll go back to what Alex Hines uh, said, and I want to read you one particular statement that, that he's read. And perhaps you could answer me in a very simple answer, yes or no, whether it's right. We have more than enough money to maintain a safe and reliable network. The, initi the issue is how much is available for the next control period for enhancements. That is what the live negotiation about. So I is he wrong when he says that, yes or no? I mean, he's saying there's enough money, yeah. and he said that Network Rail has successfully argued the need for that money. So I I I'm, I'm unclear. There seems to be completely two different views. Is he right or is he wrong? No, no there's not two completely different views. You're incorrect in that. He's, a he's absolutely correct that when it comes to renewals, the money that he's argued for for renewals which is simply replacing like for like, if that was what you wanted to do, which would make no sense at all, because you'd obviously want to upgrade, enhance for current growth capacity plus future growth capacity, then if that 1.9 billion for one element of railway funding is there, that's not what the argument between the Scottish government and the UK government is about. That's not where the, the difference exists between us, whether or not there's money there for renewal of the network. The difference or the argument, the tension between the two governments comes from the fact that when you look at the overall real package, not one part of it, there's no point of looking at just one part of a funding settlement. When you look at the entire railway package, the funding falls about £600 million short because of the various inconsistencies that I've already mentioned on the record. Now, in fairness to the Chief Secretary of Treasury, I'm trying to be helpful here, the, the, in fairness to her, she has listened on a call between myself, her, Derek Mackay. She's listened to our argument about inconsistencies. She's promised to go back to look at those numbers. 
and she's promised to come back and you know, consult with us further. I appreciate the fact that she's done that. I'm hopeful that will take us closer to the number, if not to the number, that the railway industry needs. But if you were to ask Network Rail uh, what the industry needs, they would not say that for the entire rail package that they would simply need 1.9 billion. That would be incorrect. The renewal side of it, perhaps, uh, yes. But the entire railway package, uh, if anybody suggests that we should be thankful that we're simply getting the money we need to operate a safe railway uh, and no more than that, then I think that would be a very difficult position for anybody to hold. Well, I, I think that it's a, a question that I'm going to have to take up with Alex Hines because the, the evidence that he, suggest, he has given is very different to what you're saying there. But it's not I'm, different I'm at all. To... It's not different. I'm, I'm sorry, Convener, I have to come in. It is not different at all. I have just said that Alex Hines is correct when he talks about renewals. What I've said to you, Convener, respectfully, is that when you look at railway funding, you must look at the entire package. And Alex Hines would have no difficulty in saying that. In fact, having read, and I have his transcript in front of me, he obviously is talking about renewals because he's been asked about renewals. If you had asked him or the, any other member had asked him about the entire railway package, of course, enhancements are a necessary part. Not an add-on, not a, not a desirable part but an absolutely necessary part of railway funding. So there is no difference, convener, and any suggestion on the record that there's a difference I would challenge robustly. Okay, and, and uh, I'm, I'm going to park it there and refer for the committee who can look at the evidence, um, and I, I'm going to move on uh, and let Mike come in and then get, move on to, to Peter. Uh, just, just listening carefully to, the, to your evidence, Minister, I just wanted to clarify in my own mind what, what you were saying. Did you ask the Chief Secretary of the Treasury what criteria she used for moving from 11% down to 10%? Could you yes. confirm? What, 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 did you ask her that? What did I, she I say? did. Yes, I did. And, and, and you know, I have to say from my conversations with Liberal Democrats, they, they've also been helpful in the sense that they want the, they've told me that they would like to see Scotland's railways appropriately funded as well, and I appreciate that uh, very much so. Uh, what I would say is that when I asked that exact question, uh, we were told that they were moving to a Barnet-based formula because they were moving towards funding the railway through grant as opposed to through the debt financing that has been, uh, mm. the railway has previously been funded to. Right. The point we made to them was you can't unilaterally make that decision mm. to entirely fund the railway through grant. It therefore has the implication that I've mm. spoken about in terms of a shortfall without any consultation, conversation with the Scottish Government. So if you're moving away from that 11.17%, which has been agreed by the ORR to a Barnett-based formula, because you're moving towards a grant-based system as opposed to a debt financing, then you can't do that unilaterally because it clearly uh, affects the Scottish Railway and Rail Network. Okay. Peter, the next question is yours. Yeah, thanks, Convenia. Um, no Scottish statement of funds available has been published yet for period six. Uh, when do you expect to publish this and uh, what impact is the delay in publication having on the periodic review process? I mean, I'll, try, I'll keep this one brief because I'm not going to capitulate uh, on the figures uh, that have been offered by the UK government. And if that means delaying the statement of funds available, then I've written to the ORR to, to give them the reasons for that. Uh, we're in the middle of a live negotiation. I'm not going to be pushed because I've got a deadline to... To, to, to produce the statement of funds if I'm not content, satisfied uh, with the outcome of these negotiations. So um, I can't give them a date because that will depend on uh, whether or not the uh, Chief Secretary of the Treasury is able to rectify the inconsistencies within the funding formula. Uh, if she's able to do that, then you know we'll, we'll of course, then uh, thereafter uh, publish that. Now, any... Uh, uncertainty to the rail industry, of course, is, is unwelcome, and we want to give as much certainty as possible. And therefore, I will take the Chief Secretary of the Treasury at her word uh, that she will look at the inconsistencies that we highlighted and that she'll come back to us sooner uh, rather than later, which will allow me to, of course, to, to publish that uh, statement of funds. I mean, you say you won't be pushed, but you know, what, what uh, implication is this having on the periodic review process? You haven't answered that bit of the question. Yes, I mean, I can, I'll ask my officials to come in, but of course we'll, we'll ensure that progress is made uh, through the periodic uh, review process. I mean, we fully expect Network Rail, for example, to publish uh, its draft strategic business plan for Scotland in December as scheduled. So they're saying to us, 
that won't be affected, but uh, they still have plans to publish that in December, but perhaps my director of Rio want to, well, might want to add to that. We'll just say we, we, we published the uh, high-level output specification uh, for the next control period in the summer and, and, and uh, by the appropriate date, so NetRail understands our specification for the next control period. We are working with NetRail colleagues on the development of the pipeline of projects, which the minister referred to earlier, for the next control period, and development activity in this control period is fully funded. So our instructions to, Scott Rail are, uh, to, to Network Rail are to carry on developing on the basis that the funding will be resolved. Uh, and I've asked uh, to be drawn to my attention any, any issues that were causing any delays, and I've been told that there are none so far. So we're watching that very carefully. We continue to work collaboratively whilst uh, the final fundal settlement is, uh, is resolved between governments. Okay, thank you. I mean, there's obviously a debate about, about a funding shortfall in your opinion, there's a funding shortfall, but the UK government has highlight, highlighted Barnet consequentials from the HS2 project as one way of boosting expenditure uh, on, uh, on, in rail in Scotland. Can you provide any details of the amount this Scottish government is receiving in consequentials uh, from this project and whether this, the intention is to invest this sum of money into uh, Scotland's rail network. I mean, the member will, I'm sure, be, be aware, if, he, if he's not already, that when it comes to spending review, I mean, consequentials are, are, are determined uh, at a departmental level uh, as opposed to you know, programme level. And so, therefore, it's not possible to isolate uh, the financial impact of independ independent individual spending uh, decisions such as, as, as HS2. Uh, but fair to say that you know, the UK government, as part of the discussions and live negotiations, have talked about consequentials from HS2 as being part of the funding for, for CP6 and additional funding for CP6. And I accept that. And of course, all Barnet consequentials will be gratefully received. Uh, I think the difference and the difficulty is that you can't plan a railway based on Barnet consequentials. You don't know how much is going to come. You don't know when they're going to come. Uh, and as I say, they come as that kind of uh, lump sum as opposed to individual, you know, broken down by individual uh, spending decisions. So, um, you know, it's not a way to plan a railway, but, you know, if consequentials come, then, of course, uh, people, uh, you know, consider them as part of the package and they will be, you know, received and greatly, gratefully received. Mm. I mean, I, I, you're saying that you've no idea what, what these consequentials may amount to. I mean, you must have some, you must have some indication of what sort of sums are, are, are involved in, in that. Well, I mean, I, I'm not convinced that I have uh, full certainty uh, in, in the figures that are being quoted when it regards to, to HS2. I mean, we work closely with the HS2 team and work closely with the UK government. Uh, but if you were asking me on my opinion from having dealt with major rail projects, whether or not I have certainty uh, on, on the figures involved and what the Barnett consequences will be uh, and what year they will come to us, uh, what the amount will be each year, uh, then I don't have that certainty. And it wouldn't be a sensible or prudent way to uh, to run or fund a rail network, um, but if you know if the member wishes to 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 pursue his colleagues um, south of the border to to ensure that those consequentials from any HS2 spending comes to Scotland, then of course, as I say, they will be uh, gratefully received. Stuart, okay. mm. just on a technical point, uh, can the minister confirm that Barnet consequentials are, of course, an annual allocation of funds, whereas uh, the basis of funding uh, for railways is on control periods, which are five-year periods, and that the statement of funds which we await uh, would address a five-year period. So to move to a system whereby we only know year by year uh, what the funding would be available would be to critically, critically impede our ability uh, to plan for the long term. I agree entirely. This is the point, that you can't plan for a railway simply based on consequentials that come year on year. You have a five-year control period, which members are aware of, uh, and uh, everything that the member says, uh, I would uh, agree with wholeheartedly. OK, we're going to move on to the next question. Uh, Rhoda. Um, I'm asking questions about ferries, so there's a number of them, I'm afraid. Um, the, can I start with just asking for an update on the services procurement policy review? When's that, the outcome of that likely to be known? 
But I'd mentioned on, on uh, I think it was the end of July, that uh, the policy review would be extended beyond uh, its, its autumn timeline. What I will do is provide an interim report, and I said uh, in response to questions from, from Tabby Scott that that would um, be in the, in the next couple of weeks, in the next few weeks, um, including the implications for our three lifeline services. Um, the reason why I need a little bit more time is because, uh, and again, without, um, uh, without, without going into detail, because I haven't released the interim report, um, I, I will need, frankly, more time in order to, to, to complete my engagement with the European uh, Commission and uh, various institutions and authorities around state aid rules, uh, in particular Altmark 4. Uh, so uh, there, there is a, there's a need for a little bit more time, and that will invariably necessitate uh, contract extensions uh, also. Can I push you a little on what you mean by a, a little more time? Are we talking months? Are we talking years? I mean, there's a couple of... Um, retendering processes that are on hold at the moment, both Guruk and um, the Northern Isles. When, yeah. when, when's uh, that likely to? Yes, uh, months, uh, of course, as opposed to as opposed to years, and perhaps I should have been clearer on that. Um, but uh, the members entirely correct that we're facing pressures uh, around most immediately Guruk to noon, and then thereafter North, uh, the, the the Northern Isles uh, ferry service. Uh, so we're in discussions around legally um, uh, how we can extend those further. Uh, and we're having those conversations. And of course, when I release the interim report uh, in the next few weeks, then I'll make mention of what we're going to do on each three of those contracts, including the most pressing one, which is Guruk. Uh, I think I have, a, I think I have a, a general question on this potentially tomorrow from, from Rhoda Grant's colleague. And, and again, I'll, I'll be saying similar because, um, you know, time is... Uh, running uh, out in terms of the extension that we've applied for, and we'll be looking for a further extension uh, thereafter. Yeah, and I, I also think that the ferry group from um, Dinun are in the Parliament tomorrow as well. Um, you touched in your opening statement on RET for the Northern Isles, um, and that's obviously very welcome. One of the issues I raised with you previously on this was RET on cabins. I mean, the cabin, there are increases in cabin costs. Now, when you're going to Lerwick, a cabin is reasonably essential. Have you given any thought to how you negotiate with Northlink to reduce those costs or indeed freeze them? Um, you know, the member does make a good point that you know, I have travelled from the Aberdeen to, to, to Lerwick and she's right that uh, you know, cabins are... Uh, you know, are, are certainly most most desirable. Um, the reason why RET hasn't been reduced is because of the capacity constraints, and we took detail to model the impact of any RET reduction. I think members across this around this table will know that there was, um, you know, there's been some capacity constraints on some of the very popular chiffs routes uh, where RET has been rolled out, particularly during the peak summer months. Um, we want to do our best to try to avoid those similar capacity constraints, uh, but she'll know that because of the reasons she's already <coughs> articulated that the, 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 the use of cabins is extremely popular. If we were to reduce RET on, reduce the fare, sorry, on, on cabins, then uh, the capacity constraints would be even more acute, particularly during the peak season. Now, we're in discussions, of course, with um, the provider circle, uh, Northlink. Uh, we've done the first phase, or so we're going to complete the first phase of, of the RET rollout, as I've already said in my opening statement, in the first half of next year, where we can make further progress on this, particularly on the cabin issue, also in consideration of future contracts, then that is something that we should look to do. Okay. Um, on RET as well, um, you worked with Pentland Ferries to reduce fares on that um, journey, and I think that was very welcome. Western Ferry serves Guruk to Danoon. I don't know if you're having similar discussions. I don't expect you to give detail of that, but are you having similar discussions with them? I think the, 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 uh, John Nichols will keep me right here uh, in terms of uh, our lead on, on ferries, but uh, my understanding was that if we introduced RET on Guruk to Danoon, it would probably increase uh, the fares. So therefore, we would have to look at an RET variance, uh, which, we, which we haven't done for Guruk to Danoon. Uh, it's not been a pressing issue in terms of Gurukdunun. There's a number of issues around Gurukdunun that she'll be aware of. The fare level 
it's not actually uh, one of them that's um, that's pressing. Uh, that being said, uh, in the interest of fairness, of course, if we got to a position where we were going to roll out RET or a variant of RET on Guruk Dunoon, then clearly uh, the, 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 any other operator would, would have to be part of that discussion the same way uh, Andrew Banks has been in, in terms of Pentland Ferries. Okay. And, and on freight, um, I'm, I, I've got, <laughs> I'm going as fast as I can, <laughs> convenient. On, on, on freight, we've taken um, evidence, obviously, on the Islands Bill, and that's an issue that's come up again, um, the cost of getting freight and services to the islands, cost of postage, deliveries and the like. Um, maybe ask you to take that away and give it some thought. I know there's a review ongoing, but it's a big issue that's come to us. The I will, and, and the member... Uh, you know, I acknowledge her interest in this and the fact that she's asked on a number of occasions. Uh, it's a live issue whenever I travel to, to many of Scotland's islands and the reason why uh, the, 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 the ferry uh, freight uh, fares review is continuing to go on is uh, because I'm not satisfied that we're at a position that is going to um, help our island economies uh, and so we're doing some further work on that but uh, of course I'll take that away. Okay, and finally, if I can just turn to the new ferries, the delay in delivery of the new hybrid ferries. Um, there is a third party review into that. Um, when will, what is the time scale for that review? When are we likely to hear? Um, at the moment, we're at the stage of looking at the short list of candidates of who can carry out that third party review. And this is a this is a model that we've used for, for example, infrastructure projects that have uh, shown signs of delay to get an external peer review to give us a better idea of timescales and timetables. So I, I don't know exactly when that will take place because once we have appointed either the individual or the, 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 the appropriate uh, consultant to do that third party review, uh, once, that's, once that organisation or person has been appointed, would it be fair then for me to then update the committee on what they suggest the timescales for that review would be? I think we'd have to do it in partnership. With them, but uh, you know, it's a it's a tried and and, and tested um, approach to, to infrastructure projects that have been delayed. And I should say, um, the caveat to, to this is that you know, having been at the launch yesterday of the Glen Sanex, this is a good news story for uh, commercial shipbuilding on the Clyde and, and the workforce in the Clyde. If we remember where Ferguson's was, to where they where they are now, and 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 how yesterday went, then they've come a heck of a long way. And I know members across the table will support them in their efforts, but she's absolutely right. We need to ensure that there's no further uh, delay and try to, to nail down the timescale of uh, the, the two ferries that they're building for us. Okay, and what... Um, Rhoda, I think you're, you're, I, I will let you, I'll let you do this last one. You, you pushed one. it quite a long way <laughs> Sorry, by not looking were, at me. But there say. was a lot of questions <laughs> um, on ferries. Um, there will be an impact to the delay in delivery of those two new ferries, um, and given capacity issues in the summer and sailing issues in the winter, what, what impact is that going to have on the communities that we're looking forward to being served by those yeah. ferries? I mean, currently the, the communities are served, and, and, and uh, you know they will clearly be better served with um, you know, a longer vessel and more capacity, and so on and so forth. So I know it's disappointing. Uh, from those who are on our, in, in particular, uh, this delay, they were expecting that vessel to be there summer. Now it will be closer to, 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 to winter time, so there will be an impact. But you know, to give some reassurance that they will still be served with the level of service that they have at the moment, uh, we don't see a diminution uh, in that uh, at all. But uh, clearly, I'll be speaking to the stakeholders on Arran uh, to hear from them directly on what they feel the impacts uh, will be, and that will include a discussion with the Arran Economic Group, who I have a very uh, good relationship with. Just, just before we move on to Richard's question, just because you, you, you were at the launch yesterday of the Glen Sanox Ferry, could you just confirm to me, is it 19 or 20 that it's coming into service? It was unclear from the reports I, I read. Winter uh, 19 is likely. So, Sorry, winter 18, 19, so we say 2019. So I'll just look towards my, uh, yeah. my, my colleagues. Yes, uh, to it's, it's due for delivery uh, in winter um, 18, 19. Uh, thereafter, there will be a period of crew familiarisation and... Uh, getting to know the vessel by the operator. So it's not possible to specify a, a, a particular uh, entry into service date at, at this time, but obviously we'll... Uh, so, the committee. <laughs> so um, Minister, without pushing it too far, winter 1819 probably goes through to uh, probably March or, 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 or April 2020, uh, if you take the winter period. Could you try and define wh which period, when winter will end? So people will know, in your calculations, when the ferry will be in service. 
<laughs> uh, it's not good enough just to say winter. It's too big a period, Minister. There, is, uh, there are some things I have control over, uh, convener. Uh, when winter finishes in Scotland is certainly not one of them. But I, I take his general point. But I should have been perhaps clearer. When, when I talk about summer and winter, we talk about the, the t very timetables. So essentially the, the winter timetable. So it could be into March. At the end of March technically is the end of 2020. Uh, no, no, 2019. 2019. 2019. Okay, uh, thank you. So that, 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 that is why, you're absolutely right to, to ask the question, look, can you narrow that down? That is exactly why we want to do the third party review. That third party peer review should hopefully be able to nail down a, a more exact time range than the winter 1819. Thank, thank you. Richard. Yeah, just a, a quick question. Um, a recent visit to Orkney on the ferry, um, I actually asked to see the cabins and I thought they were, they were excellent. Can you confirm to us, uh, I was given a price, um, you know, just out of curiosity. Um, basically, can you give us the, tell the committee or write to the committee the, what they charge for uh, the cabins? Uh, I mean, I could. It would depend on the time, uh, again, winter, summer, peak, off peak. So is it similar to if you go and stay in a hotel in a particular time of the year or book, or depending on how far do you, do you, do you advance book? There's a different price. There's, there's various offers and discounts and, and pricing structures and so on and so forth. We could probably get a broad outline and, and send that on to the committee of the members. Uh, it would be interesting. And see how it compares with the Caledonian sleeper. All right. <laughs> sure. Fulton, I think the next question is yours. Thanks, convener. Um, and thanks, uh, Minister and Panel. The Transports, um, the Audit Scotland pr uh, published their... Um, the review on Transport Scotland ferry services on the 19th of October. How do you think, uh, what's, your, what's your view on the six recommendations, Minister, and what, how do you think Transport Scotland intend to take these forward? Um, I, do, I did welcome uh, the report at the time uh, that it came out, and I continue to, to, to welcome it. It should be said that uh, one of the parts of the report that wasn't, uh, that wasn't given so much coverage uh, was that uh, Audit Scotland said that ferry services are performing well and customers are generally happy uh, with, their, with their ferry services, and I think that's been reflected on the experience that members have had with our ferry services up and down the country. I would hope uh, also, um, there was also obviously the, the, the main line that was uh, in the Audio Scotland report that was given um, public airing was around the amount of significant investment uh, and, and how to make that sustainable. Uh, and so we have significantly invested in our ferry services in the £1 billion value of the, the CHIFS contract. Um, you know, the, the, the two vessels are coming in at just uh, almost £100 million uh, as well. What the Audit Scotland report, the main recommendation, I would say, in my opinion, was that there has to be a long-term view of ferry services. Now, we have the ferries plan up until 2022. We also have annual reporting uh, as well in terms of, of, of vessels and, and deployment. But what I would say is there's a, there's a very good recommendation there, I think, from Audit Scotland to look beyond that uh, time scale uh, as well. Now, I wouldn't want to say too much because I'm, I'm very aware that Audit Scotland are uh, in front of the uh, Public Audit and Legislative a uh, post-legislative scrutiny committee tomorrow, so they'll be discussing uh, perhaps that report. But um, you know, I certainly welcome it. Okay, no, I'm thinking about it. Okay, the next question is Richard Law. Yes, um, Transport Scotland established a research and evidence working group where I remit to ensure a wider national transport strategy review. The results of the call for evidence are yet to be published. Can you provide an update on the review of the National Transport Strategy, setting out key milestones in the process leading up to the publication? Um, on the first part of this question, I'll perhaps um, in a second refer to, 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 to Heather Cowan, who's leading this uh, for us from, uh, in terms of Transport Scotland. What I would say in the National Transport Strategy review, it's been a very collaborative approach that's been taken. I've been really pleased uh, with that approach from local authorities by the stakeholders uh, involved in the discussion. So we have a number of working groups with over 60 stakeholders uh, involved in that, a number of those uh, working groups co-chaired by uh, those um, stakeholders and headed by uh, those stakeholders. Um, and I'm right in saying in terms of the evidence of research group, I think chaired by an academic uh, as well. So you know we have external stakeholders also chairing some of those working groups. Uh, when I co-chaired uh, a recent event with COSLA, uh, some good feedback uh, uh, from them. In terms of the, the milestones that you talk about, I just have a, a note here, which um, again, uh, for, for the sake of brevity perhaps, is better I, I send on to the 
to the convener with the key milestones of uh, the National Transport Strategy Review. Uh, some people have said, look, it doesn't have to be such a, a lengthy process. When you're looking at the 20-year forecast of, of, of our transport priorities, uh, I think taking time in a collaborative manner is the right way to go. Yeah, in, for have, oh sorry, yeah, I wanted to sorry you or, or sorry did, uh, on the, on the sorry it was uh, Heather Cowan come on. Yeah, on the research and evidence group, we've we've had the responses to that, and the members of the group are still doing the analysis. They intend to do um, one page brief for each of our working groups, and the intention is to publish that later this year. When? Um, be before December 2018. This is still ongoing. We're waiting. Before for December. It. Before December this year. Right. Okay. Thanks. Um, how does the review of the NTS tie in with strategic uh, transport projects review? Question you get asked fairly often and, and, a, and a fair question to ask. I think a lot of people have an interest in strategic transport projects review because it relates to their constituency or the regions that they represent. So, uh, what we've said. I'll not is, mention me. <laughs> I've got a fair idea. Um, so, so, the NTS <laughs> will be done because it's that 20 year forecast. The STPR will follow that. But what we've done is do some preparatory work in parallel with the NTS review as well. So an example of that would be um, the borders appraisal study or the study that we are soon to appoint consultants for in relation to the A77 and the A75 focused on the Cairn Ryan ports. So some of that STPR work has already taken place, running in parallel, but the bulk of that will be done as a follow-on from the NTS review, which informs the STPR. Thank you. Can I, sorry, just for a, a point of clarity, Heather, you made a comment that it would be published before December this year. That, that intimates it, it's imminent. Did you mean before the end of December? Sorry, I just want to give you the chance to correct that. Yes, uh, that, that clarification would be helpful to me, convener, thank you, before end of December this year. So this thank year. you. Um, okay, uh, I think I preempted something Stuart was going to ask, therefore. So I'm going to move on to the deputy convener, Gail Ross, with the next question. Thank you, convener. Um, Minister, last week we heard from several representatives of the food and drink sector, and as you know, um, the Ambition 2030 strategy aims to double the value of the sector um, in the next, uh, well, 12, just over 12 years. But they did mention that there was going to have to be some improvements in both <coughs> road and rail infrastructure. Um, so how are you going to develop the strategic links so that there is a, a smooth transition to what we're trying to achieve in 2030 between the policy areas about transport and, and food and drink and indeed other sectors? Uh, the member will be aware that uh, whenever uh, transport issues are discussed at this committee, I, I look over uh, the transcripts and, and, and the evidence is taken in, in great detail and I thought the evidence provided by uh, food and drink representatives was very, very helpful and aligned very well with, with what we're doing. Um, a key focus for us in not only the current control period, but certainly in control period six also will be freight. So moving freight from road uh, onto, onto rail. And I think we're on the cusp of some very, very exciting projects. Uh, I think there are some real um, wins to be had on, in terms of the timber industry, but also food and drink. And, and the Whiskey Highway is a, another classic example of that. Uh, when I was on the, the, the A95 speaking to, to those in the northeast, a real desire from, from the industry to, to, to of course, uh, receive some, some assistance with that. Uh, and moving freight from, from road onto rail. Uh, in terms of uh, road infrastructure too, I mentioned in my previous answer, the study we're about to appoint consultants to on the A77 and the A75, two roads that uh, I would say uh, uh, need some, some, some attention, absolutely correct. Uh, they're receiving, of course, uh, there's already work that's going on, Mabel Bypass and so on and so forth, but uh, the message from Stena and, and, and P&O is very clear that you know, we, we need more investment in that road. And again, the study that we're taking forward uh, will help us to determine that. In terms of the, the, the second part of our question, um, uh, before I came on, I had a look at the various working groups that we have. And I'm pleased to say that, um, you know, a number of organisations that have a shared agenda on this are, are, are on those groups. Specifically, we have a group called, uh, a working group that's uh, titled Enabling Economic Growth. Uh, and the Scottish Food and Drink Federation is represented as a stakeholder on that group. Um, in terms of uh, our partnership group, which is one of our groups that feeds directly into the, 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 the review group, which I uh, chair, um, we have the Confederation of Business and Industry, the Freight Trade Association, the Scottish Chambers of Comer Commerce, and so on and so forth. So I think that's how it's integrated into the NTS review. Okay, thank you. 
John, I think you could have supplemented. Th th thanks. It was just specifically, I mean, you mentioned a couple of roads there that you saw as priorities, and I just wanted to, wanted to throw in the 82 at Loch Lomond. I mean, I do feel that is a major route in this country, uh, covering <coughs> really the, from the central belt to the whole of the western Scotland. Uh, would that also be one of the ones you would be looking at? Uh, I shouldn't have started this, uh, I feel. Um, the, we obviously think forward the target 10 Barnum scheme. Uh, not only that, uh, we've listened to what the community have said in terms of widening that scheme from from, uh, from six metres to, to seven um, uh, metres uh, and even beyond. So we're working very closely with the community to get some good results on the 82. And, and uh, our colleague, uh, Kate Forbes, uh, MSP, uh, recently had an 82 summit, which I attended, which again was very constructive. Uh, what I would say is, look, all of these you know, interventions uh, that members ask us to consider, you know, will be part of that STPR2 process. Clearly, there's going to be some that will be included. Clearly, there'll be some that won't be included, and, and, and that is the nature of every community I travel to wants some element of, uh, uh, of uh, investment in the trunk road that might well pass through their community. That is understandable, but we also have to weigh that up against our budgetary considerations and also where we think the priority is in terms of growth and need. Uh, but he's absolutely right. Of course, the 82 is an arterial route, uh, not just for the local community, but for especially during summer period and, and tourism, tourist season uh, as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, right, the next question is Mike Rumbles. Thank you. This is focused on active travel, Minister. And can I just first of all start by saying I know that um, I was grateful to, that, that three weeks ago the Parliament accepted my amendment to an active travel unanimously, so everybody was agreed with it, to give opportunity for cycle training for all our children. And I know it was only three weeks ago, and I know it's short, it's not a, a long period of time, but um, with your vast array of civil servants, um, when, when, when do you think you will be in a position to let the committee know, perhaps, or Parliament to know, when you might be able to give us uh, an idea when that might be rolled out. And also, if I can just add to the, to the question, um, the well, it's very welcome that the budget is being doubled from 40 million to 80, 80 million for active travel. So um, in addition to that, can you set out how the government's active travel funding will be distributed in the next financial year? But I'm far more interested in the first part of the question. Yes. Uh, I don't know why the member is uh, so surprised when his amendment passed with the vast array of Liberal Democrats in the Parliament. I'm not surprised that his amendment passed. And I was delighted to, to, to support that amendment. Um, he's asked me, I think, uh, during a general question as well on the specific issue, and I'm pleased he's raised this question once again uh, during my committee appearance. Uh, what, I, what I said last week to him um, still stands, that um, on the back of his amendment passing, um, I met with a number of cycling stakeholders and active travel stakeholders, not just cycling actually, but a number of active travel stakeholders. Uh, they specifically discussed, and we specifically discussed your amendment, specifically discussed the fact that we have a shared desire to have more of our young people uh, receiving that bikeability and cycle uh, training, both on road and indeed what's done in the, in, in, in the space of, of the school playground. Um, so those plans are being developed. You'll forgive me, it has only been a few weeks, and we need some time to, to, to develop that. And that also goes to the second part of his question, um, that um, the, the doubling of that. There's a temptation, I think, in, in, in the first year to continue along some of the existing programmes, but beef them up slightly, the mm -hmm. Community Links, Community Links Plus projects. But also, there should be some space, my direction to my officials is, there should be some space to innovate uh, and to look at where else we can try some slightly out of the box thinking when it comes to increasing active travel rates because as he mentioned during the active travel uh, debate, uh, if, I, if my memory serves me correct, that uh, you know we are not where we want to be in terms of cycle rates and, and the vision that we have mm -hmm. uh, for that 10% journey in 2020. So uh, he'll forgive me for this slight lack of detail in terms of uh, specific amendment, but he'll also be, I think, very appreciative of the fact that his amendment is actively being discussed is driving change in terms of our policy and, and, and uh, is absolutely uh, going to be part of the, uh, uh, how, uh, certainly be part of the consideration how we spend that additional funding. I'm very pleased to hear that. That's um, very helpful. Thank you very much. Okay, the next question is John. Thank you. Um, two bre very brief questions on finance, if I may, Minister, connected with active travel. Will local authorities be required to uh, match fund Scottish Government funding under any new arrangement? And as regards the uh, walking, cycling and safer streets budgets, uh, will it be retained uh, um, in a ring fence capacity in the future? 
I mean, uh, in terms of the second question, first, um, you know, uh, it's already ring fenced. Uh, obviously, it will have to go through parliamentary approval processes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but I see no reason why uh, that should be no longer be ring fenced. So my expectation would be that we continue to be uh, ring fenced. But obviously, uh, um, we have a budget bill, and uh, that has to be approved by Parliament, and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> the, the 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 answer to the first question, I am hesitant to move away from the match funding criteria because um, obviously we get more bang for our buck if other stakeholders are, are also increasing the uh, match funding. Um, what I also don't want to do is increase or double the, the, the active travel budget, but uh, you know, essentially we're subsidising local authorities further. You know, if they can't meet at 50% match funding, um, uh, you know, and some authorities can match it, I would want them to raise their ambition also to what the Scottish Government is, is, is raising it to. So um, I would like to keep that 50% match funding criteria uh, where I can for community links and community links plus projects. Where there are other schemes that require you know, unique contributions, uh, you know, I'm not close-minded to them, again, with the active travel, uh, the increase in active travel, uh, but I would be hesitant to move away from that 50% match funding criteria. And the evidence for community links and community links plus is that we're not undersubscribed for applications. In fact, if anything, uh, very much oversubscribed, particularly for community links. Um, and the geographic spread of those projects we need to look at, and we're doing that already because um, we want to make sure there's an, a rural, obviously, as well as an urban focus uh, on active travel. And uh, again, if the local authorities in rural areas are struggling with perhaps expertise. Uh, we know local authorities will come to us and say, you know, we, we struggle with having the actual expertise and the human resource to work on active travel. If we can assist with that, it's not something I'm entirely close-minded to, to. Okay, thank you. That's very reassuring. You, 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 you've talked about the encouragement on the back of what Mr. Rumble's talked about there, about encouraging young people. I obviously want to see increased numbers um, involved in active travel. But of course, with this increased numbers, there will be increased exposure to some of the, the risks. And briefly, if you can comment on opportunities that are taken to reduce the risks to those involved in active travel. For instance, there's some concern about that there isn't a uniform interpretation of the existing guidance in respect of 20 mile an hour limits for local authorities. And do you see a benefit, for instance, in the... In your, clearly work out why I'm asking this, in the, um, a default position of a 20 mile an hour in built up mm. areas? I mean, I'd be, I'd be interested to, to even take some of this conversation offline, because obviously the member's previous experience uh, in terms of uh, police, uh, and, and he would have uh, attended, I imagine, a number of, of road traffic incidents, and, and no doubt even a number uh, involving cyclists, so his own experience would be actually deeply uh, helpful. Uh, and some of our consideration on this. In terms of uh, his general point, I agree entirely that uh, the more, the safer we can make our roads, the more confidence uh, people will have to use them. In particular, the more confidence adults will have to have their children use uh, the roads. And we heard that in, during the active travel <coughs> debate. I, I think it was uh, uh, Brian Whittle, MSP, but a number of MSPs, I think, made the same point that they would have confidence for their children using the roads if there was infrastructure and segregated cycling infrastructure. So I'm a big proponent of that. Uh, and I've even been critical uh, of those in local authorities that I, I think have made uh, decisions that have been unhelpful uh, in that regard. In terms of a specific question around 20 mile per hour zones, I, I touched upon this in yesterday, uh, yesterday's road safety uh, members debate um, where his colleague Mark Ruskell spoke. Um, his colleague Mark Ruskell is obviously taking forward a bill I've promised to meet Mark Ruskell fairly soon to hear the consultation responses. I have to say, I think there's some challenges around a blanket 20 mile per hour approach, which local authorities tell me about. Notwithstanding that, uh, the principle around reducing speed limits in order to make our roads safer is one that is very difficult to argue with, and therefore I'm going to keep a very open mind to Mark Ruskell's um, bill uh, as it moves uh, forward. And there are other issues to look at. I mean, often uh, cycle helmets are, are spoken about. Uh, as well, and uh, there's a debate in the cycling community around that. I wear a cycle helmet whenever I cycle. Um, his colleague, uh, usually Patrick Harvey, when he cycles, doesn't wear a cycle helmet. Now he has his reasons for that. I'm not dragging Patrick into this conversation. Uh, he has, he has. You'll his, appreciate I'm not here to ask, <laughs> answer for the dress code. No, no. In fairness to Patrick, he has his reasons for that, and he explains them to me. I, I don't necessarily agree. I have to say, but there is a division in the cycling community around, you know, you know safety measures. So we have to also balance. Uh, uh, those as well as doing what you know the consensus agrees with in terms of set infrastructure uh, and indeed uh, <laughs> looking at speed limits too. Okay, many thanks indeed, Minister. Um, 
Fulton, I'm going to bring you in there. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, just, a, just a brief supplementary on the active travel issue. Um, will there be any input from the Scottish Government around um, when, it, when it's a wholly local authority <coughs> decision and a wholly education decision? And the reason why I bring that up is actually at a public meeting uh, just last night um, that North Lanarkshire Council had called relating to increasing the distance uh, for, for eligi eligibility for children to travel to school from two miles to three miles for secondary school and one mile to two miles for primary. And one of the things that came up in that, one of the responses that the Council were given was, well, the Scottish Government are all for active travel anyway, so you can just all take your bikes. Now, you can imagine what the parents were, were thinking in that, but there's ov obviously all the safety issues. So will there be a role there <clears throat> for your... Um, for your ministerial role in terms of helping local authorities um, to respond to that? Mm, I wouldn't imagine so in the sense that uh, obviously we want to see an increase in active travel. Uh, that doesn't mean that local authorities, you know, could simply use that as, a, a, as an excuse That's for, uh, uh, you know, for, for cutting services. That would be uh, uh, incorrect and we have to recognise there'll be a number of reasons why not every single pupil can cycle. Uh, we want to try to work with our additional budget to make cycling more affordable. But uh, he'll know that from the statistics that we already have, that cycling is still, unfortunately, has seen too much as a middle-class activity. So we need to make sure other socio-economic, uh, uh, those that are in other socio-economic demographics also have access to active travel, uh, as well as those in, in higher economic uh, brackets. So um, there's a number of reasons why people might not be able to cycle to school, and there might also be accessibility issues. So again, we're working to see how we can try to mitigate them, but there might still exist accessibility issues. So we know, obviously, not everybody uh, can cycle uh, to school, but where we can make it, uh, easier than we certainly will, but that shouldn't be our our, our aims uh, are, are around um, active travel. Uh, I think it would be uh, uh, foolish to, to 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 use them as uh, uh, without talking about specifics in the general to use them uh, to, to to as an excuse to to cut services or reduce services. Okay, okay thank you, Minister. We seem to have uh, got to the end of the questions. Uh, roughly where uh, timing was where I'd hoped to be. So thank you very much for, for your answers and thank the committee for their questions. And I'd like to briefly suspend the, the meeting for five minutes to allow the <coughs> witnesses to leave uh, and before we move on to the next subject. So therefore I spend the meeting for five minutes. <laughs>